All right, folks, uh, I want to uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Ruel Gorecht. I'm a senior fellow at FDD. Uh, I think you probably have already uh, perhaps seen the bios on these gentlemen, so uh, I don't think there's any great need uh, to introduce them. I, I would just like to say this. Uh, uh, I met uh, Peter uh, uh, just after the attack on the USS Cole uh, in, in Aden. Uh, actually, we were in Sana, I think, uh, and where we met. And uh, I have to say that uh, I truly admired what uh, Peter was doing. He'd given up a rather remunerative job at, at CNN to follow his passion uh, on Al-Qaeda. Uh, and for all of uh, you folks who haven't actually, uh, you know, sort of jumped into the cold sea of trying to write a book uh, for the very first time. Uh, it's a bit of a scary project, particularly uh, if you're in some land like Yemen trying to make sense out of it all. Uh, and uh, I uh, greatly admired him then for doing that, and I still do. Washington is not a city blessed with that many intrepid souls. Uh, now, uh, Peter had, had written something for the uh, New York Times Magazine right after the death of Al-Qaeda, which of course caught my interest. Uh, it, uh, it essentially uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda was, was toast. And I remember I sent an, uh, an email uh, to Peter at that time asking him, since he was superannuating his profession, uh, did he have any intention of committing seppuku? <laughs> uh, and to make a long story short, we went back and forth, and this little discussion debate is, uh, is, is a product uh, of, that, uh, of that dialogue. Now, I want to say that uh, uh, in this debate, we're going to have, we're going to play by Oxford rules, uh, which means that uh, all of you will be asked to sort of vote your preferences for the revolution, uh, resolution, against the resolution, or undecided. Uh, since uh, I used to be in the CIA and I'm quite familiar with cheating, uh, I suggest that you not cheat uh, and vote one way and then flip your vote uh, so you can win by Oxford rules because it is the movement of that vote uh, that designates uh, the winner uh, of today. So uh, I think you are aware of what the re resolution is, that uh, uh, essentially it's, uh, it is uh, Al-Qaeda dead. It is it no longer a threat. Uh, and uh, the motion, for the motion, we're going to start uh, with Tom, uh, Thomas Lynch, uh, and he will lead off, uh, and then uh, uh, Tom too, Tom Jocelyn uh, will follow, and we'll take it from there. Uh, each speaker will have seven minutes uh, in the beginning. Tom, to you. Thanks very much, Raul, and, and thanks to all of you for coming here today. Let me stand so I make sure I can be heard in the back, since I see we've got a, a few further back there. Uh, as Rule mentioned, I'm a research fellow over at National Defense University and the Institute for Strategic Studies there. Uh, and so I must make this opening statement. The uh, opinions I'm going to express right now are, of course, my own and don't represent uh, the opinions or the positions of my direct employer, National Defense University, or the Department of Defense or the United States government. If I may, let me also offer a little bit of context for those of you that may have skimmed my bio in terms of some uh, personal background related to my time in working on uh, this topic as well as my other research portfolio areas of South Asia and the Near East. Uh, before retiring from the military in 2010 to assume the position I'm in now and pursue scholarly research on these topics, I did spend uh, my last six and a half to seven years in uniform uh, directly interacting with the jihadi threat uh, while living and working in the countries impacted most by that threat. I served most of the year in Afghanistan while military special assistant to our then ambassador there, Zalmay Khalizad, in 2004 was then special assistant to John Abizade, uh, the uh, commander of CENTCOM, where he asked me to look in his blind spots as he was focusing on Iraq. So that meant I was living and working a lot in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Djibouti, and Somalia. I then went to Qatar, spent two years in a command position in the Army where I was responsible for the force protection against jihadi attacks of U.S. military and civilian personnel in both Qatar uh, and Saudi Arabia, as well as later in the United Arab Emirates. And finally, I concluded my career as a special military assistant uh, to Admiral Mike Mullen for South Asian counterterrorism efforts, which allowed me to again travel and spend a lot of time in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. So in each of these roles, I've seen the faces of Al-Qaeda, I've seen its parent ideology, and I've seen the practical sense about what they 
present to us as a challenge or an issue. And it's in this sense that I stand here today resolved uh, with Peter Bergen that Al-Qaeda is in fact defeated. And let me explain that. We contend here today that what we have known as Al-Qaeda since 9-11 and feared is in fact defeated. Severely eroded before the May 2011 death of Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, the organization and its global reach, which was worthy of the kind of mystique and obsession and expense that's commanded our attention for more than a decade, that was already eroded. And I argue to you, as I think Peter does as well, that we still underestimate and, and underappreciate the significance of bin Laden's death to the essence of what Al-Qaeda was. Bin Laden as a personality was no less relevant to turning the ideology of Salafi jihadism, and I'll come back to Salafi jihadism in a second, into a globally threatened movement than Lenin was to Marxist Bolshevism, turning what had been a mixture of unionists, trade unionists, and politicians into a threatening, violence-wedded communist ideology. Much like Lenin was for global communism, Bin Laden was a unique visionary, combining charisma, an ability to communicate, and an ability to creatively fuse disparate and diffuse factions with a Salafi jihadi predisposition into something galvanized and formidable, and indeed focused on places like New York, Washington, D.C., London, and Madrid, Spain. The unique and acute problem that was Al-Qaeda, therefore, was its credible ability, which existed for a while but is no longer extant, to bring together the wider elements of the Salafi Jihadi movement and focus it on out-of-area strikes and attacks. We argue today, I think as senior Al-Qaeda scholars have since before 9-11, that there were five elements in bin Laden's Al-Qaeda that made it historically unique and a severe threat. First. It aspired to be a core organization dedicated to planning, recruiting, and training for, and organizing, and this is the important word, for catastrophic, globally oriented terror. All right? And that was for the purpose of driving Westerners out of Muslim lands. Second, it was to serve as a vanguard for organizing and coordinating already existing local and regionally focused jihadist groups. And might I add, jihadist groups in the 1990s were killing in the tens of thousands in countries like Algeria, Egypt, Pakistan and India, to organize those into a wedded, focused, cohesive element focusing on American Zionist crusaders, as they refer to them, in the Middle East. Again, for the purpose of driving Westerners out of Muslim lands. Third, and though a lesser aim, to serve as an inspiration and a focal point for disaffected lone wolf Muslims worldwide to act out on their frustrations in a violent way in Western countries. Again, for the purpose of driving Westerners out of Muslim lands. Fourth, and I think very important, Al-Qaeda of bin Laden aspired to serve as a brand name, representing the very highest kind and level of Salafi jihadi ideology, bringing together successful violence against outside elements into this fused, organized element, focusing on crusader governments, okay? And here there was this kind of notional, mystical mystique surrounding bin Laden, this notion that he had impunity, that the long arm of Western justice or international law could not catch up with and make him pay the ultimate price for his activities. And fifth, and I think important, and I come back to this in question and answer, that Al-Qaeda would serve as the base for the conquest of Afghanistan, an element in an area that had a mystical lore in terms of how Al-Qaeda perceived and conceived of itself. Now I argue to you, as I think my partner does as well, Peter here, that these five essential elements of bin Laden's Al-Qaeda, three of them were devastated by May 2011 and the nature of the raid in Abbottabad. First, the notion of Al-Qaeda as a brand name, that it was free from retribution, that came, that came falling down dramatically by the way in which the raid occurred and the finality in which bin Laden was settled. Second, the idea and the essence of Al-Qaeda as the premier Salafi jihadist organization able to plan, recruit, and conduct successful overseas terrorist operations has been put asunder in the last five to six years. You know, we can all point to things that have been planned in Pakistan, but as my partner will show in his comments, the success rate in Western countries by bin Laden's Al-Qaeda in terms of its planning and franchising activities has been very minuscule in the years, especially since 2006. And finally, there was this critical notion of Al-Qaeda as a base for certain success in Afghanistan. And this too has been dashed, particularly since when one looks at bin Laden's current successor, Zawahiri, Zawahiri has nowhere near the relations or the affiliations that mattered a lot to the uncomfortable but managed relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And I think that's an important notion here, such that Al-Qaeda cannot itself right now be the ones to claim success in any ultimate uh, victory should that occur. And I'm not forecasting it, but should that occur in Afghanistan. So where does that leave us? 
I think where it leaves us is with but two of the five key dimensions of bin Laden's al-Qaeda that we legitimately have to worry about. But these two, I would argue to you, are not new, nor were they ever the exclusive purview of bin Laden's al-Qaeda. Indeed, the conduct of wider regional and local acts of terrorism and violence in Muslim countries by groups or individuals inspired toward the Salafi jihadi ideology remains relevant. Only we must now get our heads around approaching this differently. Without the fear or the overaction, oh, correction, the overreaction that was required when there seemed to be a competent and, co and complete base known as Al Qaeda. As I've already mentioned, we need to understand that there is no logical successor to bin Laden. Zawahiri, the current leader of Al Qaeda, does not have the charisma, the connections, or the purposeful focus on out of area attacks and operations that bin Laden did. And my partner will address that, I think, a little bit in his formal remarks. Next, when you take away bin Laden from the bin Laden Zawahiri team that made Al Qaeda what it was in terms of a global organization, then you're left with a different managerial problem, and one that I will contend needs less stark Western vocabulary and less overseas military presence to deal with, a much more intelligence based legal uh, cooperation based focus to deal with the local and regional manifestations of Salafi jihadism. Thus I argue to you that our terrorism worries of today are different than those of a decade ago and we need to take a different tactical approach and Peter and I argue therefore that the relevant dimensions of Al-Qaeda's failed effort to co-opt Salafi jihadism is in fact significant and is in fact something that should influence our understanding and our tracking of what remains as a terrorist threat but not one that is of the manifestation or the concern that it was a decade ago. I believe, therefore, and I stand resolved with Peter Bergen, that we should understand at this point that Al Qaeda, the Al Qaeda of bin Laden, is defeated, all right? And that we need to take special skill and care moving forward to have less focus on applying military force whenever and whenever, however, we suspect the ideology of jihadism manifesting itself in the uh, Muslim world and instead need to focus much more on special operations, partnerships with other Muslim countries, increased intelligence and coordination with law enforcement at local levels to address the far less threatening form of terrorism that is now dominant in Salafi jihadi movement, one that bin Laden and has tried but failed to co-opt. Thank you very much. I just want to say that uh, applause is welcome at any time, booze or not. <laughs> there you are. I'll now turn to my colleague and good friend Thomas Jocelyn. So the motion is Al Qaeda is defeated. Okay. Well, when I first started preparing my remarks today, what I first did was I went back to a report that was actually published in September of 2011 by the two commissioners uh, who headed the 9/11 Commission. And I believe Peter, you were on this team as well uh, to actually update the U.S. government and the American public on exactly where we stand. They addressed the issue of whether or not uh, Al Qaeda is dead. Here's what here's what that report said. Although, although Osama bin Laden is dead, Al-Qaeda is not. It is a network, not a hierarchy. Over a period of years, Al-Qaeda has been very adaptive and resilient. Al-Qaeda and its affiliates will almost certainly attempt to avenge his death, however, they will not necessarily attack soon. Al-Qaeda's capabilities to implement large-scale attacks are less formidable than they were 10 years ago, but Al-Qaeda and its affiliates continue to have the intent and reach to kill dozens or even hundreds of Americans in a single attack. That was just over a year ago, in a report published by the two 9-11 commissioners, the two co-chairs, and, I, and again, Peter was on that team as well as some other experts. So just a year ago, this official report was saying that Al-Qaeda is actually alive and survived Bin Laden's death. But now I want to flash forward to July of this year, the country reports on terrorism, which the State Department put out. What's the official position of the State Department, and the U.S. government, and the Obama administration? Is it that Al-Qaeda is dead? No. Here's what the State Department said in July of this year. Despite blows in western Pakistan, Al-Qaeda, its affiliates, and its adherents remain adaptable. They have shown resilience, retained the capability to conduct regional and transnational attacks, and thus constitute an enduring and serious threat to our national security. That's the official position of the United States government, the United States State Department, is that Al-Qaeda is not defeated. Okay? Official position of the Obama administration. Now, if you want to go through, I can go through a whole bunch of quotes from senior officials, including Matthew Olson, the National Counterterrorism uh, uh, Center, and a bunch of others along the same, uh, same lines. They'll tell you, as, as you'll hear these gentlemen say, that in fact, you know, Al-Qaeda has suffered some, some blows, absolutely. Bin Laden's death hurt them, absolutely. Other, other blows along the lines have hurt them, including the killing of other senior Al-Qaeda leaders in northern Pakistan. But I keep coming back to what that report in September of 2011 said. It's, it's a network, not a hierarchy, okay? And so when we follow the network, what do we find? Well, you heard Tom say that uh, Mr. Ayman al-Zawahiri doesn't have the, the, quite the pull or the cachet that Osama bin Laden did. Well, in fact, every single one of the Al-Qaeda affiliates swore allegiance to Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda. All of them did. 
they all came out and swore allegiance to Al Qaeda and, and maintained, uh, maintained, maintained their roles as part of the network. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the affiliates now, just for just for a few minutes. The affiliates. Uh, this is a strategy that goes back a, a long, long time, and I think it's been misunderstood. And actually, my colleague Jonathan Shanzer is here. He actually wrote a book called Al Qaeda's Armies, which I recommend to everybody because it shows that, in fact, Bin Laden and Al Qaeda had been thinking about affiliates a long, long time ago. This was not something new. The affiliates have picked up picked up some of the slack for Al Qaeda. There's no doubt about it. Uh, my colleague Bill is going to talk. Rojo is going to talk a little bit more about Al Qaeda Central. But I'm going to I'm going to focus on the affiliates. What we've seen with the affiliates, uh, and has now been recognized by the Obama administration, is that they're growing. They're actually gaining turf, gaining ground around the world. Sometimes, in some areas, they, they're, they have taken a step back. In other areas, they're actually moving forward. Think about uh, the Sahel and Libya and Northern Africa, for example. Okay? On September 26th, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said that the rise of Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghrib and aligned movements actually represented a threat to not only the region and the many Muslims in the area, which is totally true, but also the world and, and others. European officials have said that AQIM actually poses a threat to France. You flash forward to Libya. In a report I, I actually uh, had talked about and have uh, published articles about, in August of this year, the Library of Congress uh, published a report in conjunction with the Pentagon that talked about Al Qaeda's plan for Libya. That report details in, in, in great, great detail and great names and dates and all sorts of information exactly how Al Qaeda's central leadership in Pakistan has planned to build a network inside Libya and build it up to a, the point where it has a fully operational network. You go elsewhere, you know, you talk about the success, these guys are going to talk about the success rate of Al Qaeda hitting the homeland. Well, there have actually been five plots against the American homeland, serious plots by Al Qaeda and affiliated groups since 2009. Okay? One of them was by Najibullah Zazi, uh, who wanted to bomb the New York City subways. That was diligent counterterrorism work broke that plot up. It wasn't luck. It, it wasn't luck in that case. In, another, in two other cases, diligent uh, counterterrorism work broke up plots by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which hadn't even attacked us prior to 2009, or hadn't even attempted to attack us prior to 2009. A third plot by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula on Christmas Day 2009 was foiled because passengers on board a plane jumped on board a terrorist bef before he get a second chance to detonate his, his suicide bomb. Okay, so and as the President of the United States says, has said, 300 people would have been killed if that plane had blown up. A fifth plot was by the Pakistani Taliban in May 2010. The Pakistani Taliban, according to the Obama administration, according to the State Department, according to the Treasury Department, is, has a symbiotic relationship with Al Qaeda, Pakistani Taliban. Okay? So these are five different plots against the U.S. homeland. Now what I would argue is, and this is where it's a little, my argument is a little more nuanced than what you hear, that's not even what they've been focused on most of the time throughout their existence. Okay? When you actually study Al Qaeda and its affiliates and allies, they've been focused mainly on fighting elsewhere. They spent most of their resources, most of their assets fighting elsewhere. That's what they spent most of their time doing. And they're doing that today. They keep doing that. They're, they're focused on, on killing people and, and on trying to acquire territory and trying to disrupt local governments around the world. And part of, part of what, what always gets me about this debate is we have sort of a very American-centric focus on these things. We think about, well, you know, if they can't hit us, if they can't ex execute a spectacular attack against the U.S. homeland, that means that the threat has been you know, depreciated to such a point that we don't need to worry about it. But the bottom line is, and you know, Tom had mentioned that tens of thousands of, of, um, of people have been killed you know, throughout the 1990s by jihadists or Salafi jihadist groups. Well, the bottom line is that they're still killing thousands and thousands of people and wounding thousands and thousands more each year when you look at Al Qaeda's place. The official data from the National Counterterrorism Center says that, in fact, from 2008 to 2011, 35,524 people were killed. Okay? Those are mainly Muslims in foreign lands. Okay? That's who the primary victim of Al Qaeda, its affiliates, its allies, and adherents, it's the way the, the, it's phrased in the report. Those are their main victims. When we look at the Arab Spring, we look at the potential for going forward, what do we see? Well, we see some long, we see some long term potential, absolutely. We see areas where, you know, we see hope for millions of Muslims who have nothing to do with Al Qaeda and who reject Al Qaeda. Absolutely. I, you know, you can't look at this picture and not feel hopeful for them. However, it doesn't mean that Al Qaeda doesn't have a hand to play. Al Qaeda has exploited the security vacuums in several countries. This is the official position of the U.S. government. When you look at Yemen and how they've, they've, they've exploited the, official, the security position there, National Counterterrorism says they've, ex, they've explicitly uh, exploited the, the security vacuum in Yemen as a result of the Arab Spring. You look in Libya, in eastern Libya, there's now copious evidence of what Al Qaeda is doing there. Okay? You look at various other areas throughout northern Africa. You look at, you look at Syria. Okay, what do we see in Syria right now? Now, was that rebellion started by Al Qaeda? Absolutely not. There are many Muslims in Syria that wanted Assad's terrible regime to fall, and they deserve our sympathy and support. However, Al Qaeda is attempting to exploit it and has. Al Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria have moved in with a force and are, are actually taking part in that rebellion and are, are expanding the scope of their suicide bombing campaigns. 
Just a few days ago, Al -Qaeda, uh, uh, the Associated Press reported that Al-Qaeda is making a comeback in Iraq, that they're expanding their operations. And in fact, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is so much of a threat, uh, according to the, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq's position, is so much of a threat both in Iraq and in Syria, that the Obama administration says, we can't support the good rebels in Syria because we're worried about Al-Qaeda and Iraq's position in Syria. Okay? When you look at the whole picture, the affiliates, and all the countries I just listed, and believe me, there are more, that's not the picture of an organization that's defeated. That's an or, a picture of an organization, and I'll quote again, that is adaptive and resilient, and is going to keep fighting. And if we drop the ball and say we're not going to have a vigilance to keep this fight up, then that means a lot more Muslims are going to die, and it means ultimately there's going to be a lot more successful attacks against us. Thanks. Peter, Peter Bergen to follow. Uh, thanks, Ruel, for organizing this and suggesting it. Um, my connection to, to this subject began with the first Trade Center attack in 1993, which you recall killed six people. I went to Afghanistan to do a, an hour documentary about uh, what was happening in Afghanistan. The documentary, unfortunately, uh, made the successful prediction that Afghanistan would be the, uh, sort of like Lebanon had been in the 80s, a source of terrorism and drugs in the future. And then I uh, produced bin Laden's first television in interview, in which, of course, he uh, declared war against the United States for the first time uh, to a Western audience. And I've written four books about al-Qaeda. So from a sort of self-serving professional point of view, I have every reason to pretend this problem really is a big problem, because I've devoted 20 years of my life to it. And I'm saying it isn't. Um, I feel like a Sovietologist in 1989, and that's a good feeling. Um, so. Colonel Lynch and I, um, basically our main point is the following. We're not saying that jihadist terrorism o is over. That would be a false claim. Uh, after all, jihadist terrorism has been around since, I mean, look at the assassins in the 12th century. Um, you know, it's, it's been a form of violence that's been around for a long time. What we're saying is that al-Qaeda is now defeated, incapable of its central strategic goal of mounting a large-scale terrorist attack on, in the United States. And Tom just gave you a recitation of five plots, uh, you know, re relatively recent plots in the United States. What do they have in common? Well, they all failed. They all failed. Al-Qaeda's ability to attack the United States, and even of its affiliates, it just uh, by Tom's own account, is that it, they've been failures. And uh, Tom is also saying that we're being too Americanocentric. Well, you know, last time I checked, we're at the New America Foundation. I'm in charge of the National Security Studies Program. We are mostly Americans in this room. That's our central concern: is American national security, not other people's national security. You have the fucking accent, I know. I was. <laughs> <laughs> it was born, <laughs> born in Minneapolis. I, I have my passport right here, I which, I, which I will bring out in a I minute. Believe, I believe. So it's not only Al-Qaeda's you know, own weaknesses, it's also our strengths, which are very dramatically different than they were on 9-11. On 9-11, there were 16 people on the no-fly list. Now there are 20,000. Uh, under Barack Obama, 28 leaders of, uh, and in fact, much of this data can be found on Bill Roggio's uh, website. 28 leaders of Al-Qaeda have been killed in Pakistan and Yemen. Under George W. Bush, uh, at least a dozen. Uh, killed by drone strikes. As a result, we've got Ayman al-Zawahiri, uh, who's the last leader of Al-Qaeda left. He's, uh, as, as he's got a very tough road to hoe. Uh, he's inherited the blockbuster video of Global Jihad, and he's not going to be able to turn it around. Um, the last successful attack in the West was the 7-7 attacks in London, which killed 52 commuters. Since 9-11, 17 people have been killed in the United States by people motivated by jihadi ideas, 13 of them at Fort Hood, Texas. All of those are individual tragedies, of course. But in any given year, to about two dozen Americans are killed by dogs. So you're, since 9-11, you're 10 times more likely to be killed by a dog than by a jihadi terrorist in the United States. Uh, 300 Americans roughly uh, every year get killed in the drowning accidentally in their bathtubs. We don't have an irrational fear, a fear of bathtub drownings. We shouldn't have an irrational fear of terrorism. Polling data across the Muslim world indicates that Al-Qaeda has been losing the war of ideas for many, many years. Al-Qaeda's Al ideas and foot soldiers play no meaningful role in the Arab Spring, the most important development in the Middle East since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Bin Laden's death was greeted with only minor protests in the Muslim world. Yes, of course, Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, or we still, what happened in Benghazi is still not clear, but clearly a group, let's say, inspired by Al-Qaeda's ideas uh, did this attack. 
but at the end of the day, compared to 9-11, um, it's a rather minor victory for these guys. Uh, a successful attack by a group of heavily armed men on a lightly defended building in a country that's still in a chaotic state after the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. Um, in addition, you know, in terms of the strengths that we have, uh, on 9-11 there were just a handful of joint terrorism task forces. Now there are more than 100. On 9-11 there was no National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, there was no TSA. There was no DHS. All of these things have made us a much harder target. Before 9-11, special operations forces were almost never employed against al-Qaeda and its allies. Now we have a dozen such missions every night in Afghanistan and other similar missions in countries like Yemen and Somalia. The public is in a very different uh, posture. Uh, who, you know, who, d who disarmed the, 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 uh, ab ab the, the passengers disarmed Abdul Muttalib on the plane. It was the vendor in Times Square who noticed the smoking SUV that was uh, uh, Faisal Shahzad's uh, attempt to blow up a car bomb. So before 9-11, the CIA and the FBI uh, rarely communicated. Uh, now they work closely together. And Tom brought up the question of the affiliates. I mean, yes, some affiliates are sort of doing okay, but I mean, actually, it's a largely a record of failure. Look at Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They've been turfed out of their towns in southern Yemen that they once controlled. Look at Al-Shabaab. It has been basically completely rolled back in Somalia. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, you know, what Tom fails to mention is Al-Qaeda in Iraq controlled a third of, the of, of, of Iraqi landmass in 2006. Now they're capable of doing some t terrorist attacks in central Baghdad, but it's a very different kind of situation than controlling a third of the country. And other, other affiliates we could talk about, Boko Haram. Yes, it's a problem for Nigerians, but they've shown no ability or inclination or, or, uh, to do an attack outside Nigeria. So even these affiliates are not, you know, none of them, are, most of them are not doing particularly well. And sort of just in, in summation, you know, to win World War II, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin didn't think it was necessary to kill every Nazi. And I think what the, our opponents are sort of suggesting is, you know, if a single jihadi terrorist or even just dozens of are walking, walking the earth, somehow we're losing the war against al-Qaeda, nothing could be further from the truth. Al-Qaeda's central strategic goal, as, Ta as Colonel Lynch pointed out, getting us out of the Middle East, not only failed, it backfired. The United States is more involved in the Middle East than it's ever been in its history. Al-Qaeda, which of course means the base in Arabic, lost the best base it ever had in Afghanistan, has never recovered anything remotely close. Um, it, you know, pre-9-11 churning out thousands of recruits in Afghanistan, running a sort of independent foreign policy from the Taliban, attacking our embassies, uh, and, and of course 9-11 itself. And I think 9-11 was misunderstood at the time, in a sense. It was seen as the beginning of something. In fact, it was the end of something. And right at the, when 9-11 happened, a lot of people said this was our Pearl Harbor. Well, it was, in fact, very, very similar to Pearl Harbor, but it was actually Al-Qaeda's Pearl Harbor. Just as Pearl Harbor led to the collapse of Imperial Japan, Al-Qaeda, like Al-Qaeda's attacks on 9-11 led to a strategic defeat, which has basically happened and was confirmed by the death of its leader and founder, bin Laden, um, and uh, that is the proposition we're, we're backing. Thank you. Bill Rogier. <coughs> thanks. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks all for uh, joining us, and thanks to Peter New and uh, Tom and New America Foundation for hosting this event. Um, I'm going to take a couple of quick issues, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about al-Qaeda and in Afghanistan and Pakistan in particular, because these are two theaters where we initially focused on al-Qaeda and its network immediately after the 9-11 attacks. But first of all, I want to take issue with something. We, we have, as Tom said, we have a tendency to focus on what al-Qaeda wants to do with us, but al-Qaeda has always looked at both the, the near enemy and the far enemy and has actually focused far more efforts, on, as Tom had said, on the near enemy. And what they do is they use this as a recruiting base. Uh, they use areas that they gain control of territory uh, via their affiliates to train their operatives. And a lot of them are used, yes, in conventional military operations locally, but as they did in the 1990s, they take those operatives and funnel them into special, some of those operatives, they select from them, put them in special camps, and this is how we got the suicide bombers on 9-11 and, and multiple other terror attacks. Um, the, on the issue of Salafist groups and, and Al-Qaeda, well, not only did the Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, swear allegiance to, to, to uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, but a whole slew of smaller, newly uh, grown Salafist groups in, in, in Egypt and in, in Gaza and other places, they've sworn allegiance to Zawahiri. So this notion that Zawahiri is some kind of old curmudgeon who's not well-liked in the jihadist community I would just completely disagree with that, and I think the fact that everyone rushed to his 
defense after the death of bin Laden and were quick to swear allegiance to him really refutes that point. Um, and you know, another, another quick point here, you know, dogs in bathtubs, they don't plot attacks to kill Americans and, other, and, and Muslims as Al-Qaeda does. So these are different threats. These, this is an enemy that's active, that is operating on a time frame, that we operate on a time frame of the next election. They're looking at it 50 to 100 years. That's how they're looking at this. This may actually be a low point in Al-Qaeda's operations, but that doesn't mean they're defeated. Um, now, Peter Bergen had mentioned that you know, there's only one senior Al-Qaeda leader left. Yeah, I could point you to a list of all the Al-Qaeda leaders that we've killed and, and, um, in the drone strikes in Pakistan. The reality is, is there's several more senior Al-Qaeda leaders, and I could stand here and I'll, I could point you to a list of those as well. Uh, one of them being Saif al Adel, and I could, again, I could go down the list of numerous Al-Qaeda operators that are believed to be operating in Pakistan. They're not just in Pakistan. They're moving out into other theaters, and it's not just because of the drone strikes in Pakistan. Al-Qaeda, what it's done with the drone strikes, is it's, it's tried to spread out from those particular areas in the tribal agencies. And it's, you know, but and then again, Al-Qaeda has always had a base in larger Pakistan. Where do we de detain Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? Where do we recently detain, or the Pakistanis recently detain um, the, um, a, a senior Al-Qaeda leader who was a member, uh, uh, who was a leader of its external operations? He was detained in, Ke in Keta. So, look, there are, Zawahiri is not the last Al-Qaeda leader. We don't, again, it's a, it's a network, it's not a hierarchy. Um, and look, there's been 18 drone strikes in Pakistan since we killed Abu Yahya al-Libi, who was described as al-Qaeda's number two or, or, it's, uh, or it, it, in, in various other terms. A lot of these strikes are targeting senior al-Qaeda leaders in Pakistan. Why are we targeting senior al-Qaeda leaders in Pakistan if we only have one left? We all know that Zawahiri is not hiding out in North and South Waziristan. Where did we kill, where did we kill bin Laden? Where do we capture a whole slew of, of al-Qaeda leaders in Pakistan in major cities far, far from the tribal areas. Al-Qaeda is getting out of that kill box. A, a, a document released by bin Laden said, look, we're going to send our operatives, uh, and he talked about hundreds of operatives. This was in December of 2010. We're going we're to push them into Afghanistan. Kunar, Nuristan, Zabul, and Ghazni were areas that he suggested. You can see, based on ISAF's raids over the last several years, and I'll get into that a little bit closer, um, you can see that this is actually true. I mean, we, can, we target Al-Qaeda leaders throughout Afghanistan, particularly in Kunar and Nuristan and, and other provinces. Um, and, and again, other operatives have spread out to the affiliates, but this isn't just because of the drone strikes. Al-Qaeda has always used the affiliates to farm out some of its leaders. It's acted as a, as a sort of a, a safe mechanism. Uh, the leader of, uh, of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, for instance, was once Osama bin Laden's aide de camp. Um, Al-Qaeda in the Pakistani jihadist networks, they have integrated a lot of their operations and senior leaders from these jihadist groups, such as lashkar e taiba Harkar al-Mujahideen, Huji, uh, Jaish Muhammad, a whole slew of alphabet soup of Pakistani groups have given leadership. Two senior Al-Qaeda leaders killed this year, both were Pakistanis, were top level leaders. Bin Laden mentions one of them in the documents. He, could, he describes them as the, the commander of one of several Al-Qaeda companies that were operating in Pakistan. He lay, this, one, this commander, Bader Mansour, was later named the head of Al-Qaeda's operations in northwestern Pakistan. Um, he's a name that nobody knew until he was dead. And this is a point that, that Peter Bergen makes in his book as well. Um, so, you know, you, you also see bin Laden's documents, the discussions with the movement of the Taliban in Pakistan, or the TTP. Um, they're talking about coordinating operation. You also have something called the Shuri Mukaraba, which is an Al-Qaeda brokered Taliban alliance between four very powerful Taliban groups, including, including the Khanis, including the movement of Taliban in Pakistan. And their goal is to sort of coordinate their operations in northwestern Pakistan, as well as conduct attacks inside of Afghanistan. They want to pool their resources, stop the infighting from these groups. This is something Al-Qaeda has always tried. This is one of its main goals. This is what the base is all about, to, to facilitate these, these other jihadist groups, local, regional, global jihadist groups, and get them operating in conjunction to operate in a single goal to establish their Islamic State and caliphate. Um, Al-Qaeda presence in Afghanistan. Again, you look at, you know, you could believe me, or you could look at ISAF's press releases on raids against Al Qaeda. I document these. Um, since the end of May, Special Operations Forces conducted 21 raids against Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. That's just Al Qaeda, not Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan or other allied groups. 
21 raids since May. They've taken place in 12 different districts in seven of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. They're not just confined to Kunar and Nuristan. Um, they have a, a presence throughout Afghanistan. When you look at the press releases back to 2007, you see that Al-Qaeda and all of its affiliates have been targeted in 114 of the more than 400 districts in Afghanistan in 25 of 34 provinces. Does that sound to you like a group that has been defeated in Afghanistan? 57 raids against these allied terrorist groups in Afghanistan so far this year. Again, does that sound like a group that has been beaten off the battlefield? This is the pace of these raids year after year after year. It's because they're pervasive. They have a network that is, that is well established there and they're replacing and replenishing their leaders. Um, in, in Kunar Prov the New York Times released a report er earlier this year that leaked an ISAF report on Al-Qaeda havens. Um, it described Kunar and Nuristan as Al-Qaeda safe havens. We've, done, we've killed seven senior Al-Qaeda leaders and two Lashkari type leaders in one district in Kunar province alone so far this year. Um, Al-Qaeda Al still has a close working relationship with the Afghan Talib Taliban groups, Mullah Zakir's Mullah Dadula Front. He was a Gitmo detainee. This is the, the Taliban group that conducted the raid on Camp Bastion and destroyed a Marine uh, uh, Harrier squadron just a, a couple of weeks ago. Does this again sound like a group that's defeated? The Haqqani Network designations clear. Every Haqqani Network leader that's been designated has been de designated with links, close ties to Al Qaeda. We're leaving Afghanistan and we have no coherent policy in Pakistan. So as we're drawing down, Al Qaeda is going to increase its ties with these local groups. And it's going, you know, again, Al Qaeda still has a safe haven in northwestern Pakistan and beyond. They still have a safe haven in Afghanistan. And it's only going to get worse as we decide to leave. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to let these gentlemen go at each other, but I'm going to pose a few questions to them first. Uh, and after we have this stage, I uh, will take questions uh, from the audience, and then we will have closing statements, uh, again, from uh, all of these uh, folks up here. And, and then uh, you uh, will vote again. Now, I, I did, I'll, first question I'll put to the, uh, to the, to the affirmative. I mean, I, could you help me define, I mean, let's say you have an, an Al-Qaeda affiliated group. And let's say the definition of, of affiliation is that it gives a bayah, uh, some form of allegiance uh, to Zawahiri. Uh, when does that group, in your mind, become resilient and resurgent? Is it only when it strikes inside of the United States? If it were to blow up an embassy, would that constitute uh, a resurgence. Uh, if it would blow up two embassies, would it constitute a resurgence? Or must it take down a capital ship uh, and two skyscrapers? What is what in your own mind would would mean to you that Al Qaeda is is back? Your question is a powerful one, and I'd like to take it on from the perspective of what does one compare it with, right? If, as my partner and I argue. The jihadism and Salafi jihadism is an extreme and very minority variant of an understanding of how one politically organizes through violent overthrow and return to the elders. If one agrees that that has been around for a long time, and my partner and I do, and one looks and takes a benchmark of the 1990s and asks the very same question you've just asked, okay, the attacks and activities in places like Algeria, in places like Egypt, which included attacks against American and Western consulates, tour groups, ide ideologues, in Pakistan in the 1990s, where our consulates were frequent targets of uh, groups affiliated with the Salafi uh, jihadi ideology. Uh, all those existed in a past life. Prior to Al Qaeda as a base organization, describing what I clearly disagree with Tom Jocelyn on, which is some notion that they've always been focused on these local activities, as I presented to you in my affirmative, of the five major things that defined Al-Qaeda and the Bin Laden, then Zawahiri appended organization. It was the coalescence around the idea of attack the far enemy first, to drive out the Westerners, to make it soft ground for the near enemy to be struck. And it was reluctance on the part of Zawahiri in the period from 1993 through at least 1997, when he was running his own Islamic Jihad campaign through EIJ in Egypt, to want to do that. 
And so I take issue with this claim that we are different somehow when we have these activities going on now than we were in the 1990s simply because we want to give credit to an organization that claimed to be a core, that claimed to be about driving out Western presence, and as Peter has said, failed miserably, that claims to be an organizing and cohesive force. And we see it acting now in ways that are very similar to the way it acted between 1992 and 1999. And we want to say that Al-Qaeda as this mythical organizational structure, and here's where I get into this, is it a network or is it an organization? Okay? If you are going to focus on something that's significantly different, you have to focus on Al-Qaeda, the organization, the base. Okay? It's ex post analysis for us to now accredit Al-Qaeda with this diverse networky type of structure. Indeed, that's always existed. There's always been a Salafi jihadi network since at least the time of the Egyptian Salafi activities, which, by the way, were those that underpinned and underwrote the strike against uh, Sadat in 1981 that Zawahiri was inimically about. So I think what we have here to your question is, because they're striking in Libya, because they're striking in other places right now, does that mean they're still a Qaeda affiliate? <coughs> and just because they claim or say that they're associated with this wider brand name, a brand name I might add that we know from Bin Laden's own documents, he was discouraging would-be affiliates from referring themselves to because of the diminution of the cachet of the name, I think we have something fundamentally different. And we, we know that Bin Laden in 2010 was attempting to send messages to find new names for the organization, the base, because it had lost such cachet in the Muslim world. And so it's in that space, Raul, and our opponents here in this debate, that I suggest we take a different look, a more critical look, and not give credence to the propaganda that Al-Qaeda still exists as a core, as a fundamental organization, and instead, you know, go through the mirrored windows and lenses and saying that these are, this is a network and it's somehow different than maybe it was before. It's returning to what it was before in many ways, shapes, and forms. And it's, it's important that we understand that and not give credence to an organizational thread that has got very little practical uh, manifestation on the ground. So if I could, if I could uh, take from that, then it is conceivable that Islamic jihadism uh, could be alive and well, but Al-Qaeda could be kaput. Absolutely. Okay? And that requires us to take a different vocabulary and a different approach to understanding how we tackle these problems. Not with masses of military formations and activities overseas, but rather with the interconnected intelligence activities and involvement. And I think we're seeing that start to shape and build as a frame of approach from our administration or government right now in places like Yemen and Somalia that Peter already mentioned. Now, all right, let me, let me pose a question over to the negative. Um, would you disagree with their contention that the, you know, the Al-Qaeda mojo uh, isn't doing so well uh, in the Middle East, uh, that the Great Arab Revolt has taken a great, uh, some juice out of the cause, uh, and that you do not find uh, the youth uh, in, certainly in, in Arab lands, to be as uh, susceptible to Al-Qaeda's call as it once was? Or do you think that's not true at all? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's not true at all. I'd say it's a mixed bag and it's more, far more complicated than Tom is saying. And I'll give you an example. I mean, here's what Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said on September 26th. Here's what she talked about in Northern Africa. This is exactly how she, she put it. Uh, she was talking about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. She goes, this is a threat to the entire region and to the world, and most particularly to the people in the region themselves who deserve better. They deserve better from their leaders and they deserve better from the international community. She goes on to talk about how uh, they now have a larger safe haven, increased freedom to maneuver. Terrorists are seeking to extend their reach and their networks. I know you don't like the word networks, but she used the word networks as the 9-11 commissioners. Use their, and their networks in multiple directions. And they are working with other violent extremists to undermine the democratic transitions underway in North Africa as we tragically saw in Benghazi. Uh, that's the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Okay. So you want to go not, through? You're not a little uncomfortable using Hillary Clinton as an expert on terrorism. Actually, I think Hillary Hillary has, has you know she's had a mixed bag on this stuff, but she's been better than most, I would say, in terms of government. But but you know just look at CNN. You know you want to talk about the youth right here. CNN on uh, October 4th talking about what's going on in Syria. Pro Al Qaeda group steps up suicide bombings in Syria. Okay, this is October 4th, just this month. You talk about August Al Qaeda in Libya. Okay, report, report put out by the Library of Congress in the Pentagon talks about Al Qaeda's plans and their growth in eastern Libya. Something I warned about in congressional testimony in 2011 and actually said we have to support the many good Muslims in Libya, the National Transitional Council, and all the, the, the people that want to be free in Libya to counter this threat. 
You talk about New York Times was talking about how the jihadists are actually getting the, the, the principal receiving, uh, receiving uh, principal recipient now of arms in Syria just a couple days ago, just a day ago. And that when they highlight that, they're worried about what al-Qaeda is doing there, as have Obama administration officials. This is the Associated Press, al-Qaeda making comeback in Iraq, officials say. This is just earlier this month. So yeah, OK, in some ways, al-Qaeda's brand has been hurt, absolutely. It's something I've talked about before. The reason is because the al-Qaeda brand has caused more Muslim casualties around the world than it has ever ca uh, caused in the Western world. OK, that's the truth of the matter. And so there is this, the seed of their strategic destruction is in their own terrorism, if we play it right. And if we work with our allies around the world and remain vigilant. But if we can't just blase say, you know, it's over and not, let's not worry about it. I, can, I, can I say one thing about uh, what uh, Peter and Tom were saying in response real quick? You can, but I'll um, respond. You know, they, they talk about the bureaucracy, or Peter cites a lot of statistics on the bureaucracy. Do you believe we should sh shut down the Department of Homeland Security and shut down the no-fly list and all those things? That's not the what the debate is about. No, no, but, we, but wait a minute. If you're saying that we're, we're much safer today, which I believe we are, I mean, they do a good job of shutting down plots, right? But if the debate today is, uh, is al-Qaeda defeated, your position is al-Qaeda is defeated, right? Well, then we don't need a Department of Homeland no, Security. They did, say, right? they did say that Islamic jihadism could be alive and well, but al-Qaeda is dead. That's okay, correct. good point. But still, hey, Department of Homeland I, Security. I, I just want to respond to some of the, uh, the documents that Tom just produced. You know, al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb is doing pretty well in parts of North Africa. Al-Qaeda in Iraq is maybe doing slightly better than it used to, having suffered a massive defeat in 2007. Sure. In Iraq, sure. the jihadists in Syria, we don't really know exactly what percentage of the opposition they are, but they, let's say they're doing reasonably OK. What do these things all have in common? that they don't threaten the West directly in any shape or form. These groups are not uh, successful in taking over, you know, they're, they're not going to take over the country in any of these cases. Um, they are extremely unlikely to produce training camps, tr churning out thousands of recruits as the pre-9-11 uh, Afghanistan uh, did with Al-Qaeda. And, you know, it, they're all causes for concern, but they don't get back to the, the central issue is Al-Qaeda, the central organization capable of launching a, a ma major attacks on the United States is basically done. I mean, do you disagree with that? Al Qaeda Central launching a terrorist attack against the United States. Um, I would say that's that's a very specific way of saying it. I say there is a terrorist well, that's network. That's kind of what we're talking. No, about. no, 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 no. Because no, because it has to do with can Al Qaeda Central reach out through its affiliates to attack us? Okay, and, but and there's a clear pattern where, according to the National Counterterrorism Center, according to the Obama administration, that's exactly what they're trying to do. So. Try. What's that? Try. True, but, and not but, succeeding. Tr but trying doesn't mean that the if, threat's gone. I mean, if, twice we've gotten lucky that, that they didn't kill more. That bomb off over Detroit in 2009. Do we have this discussion? If, that, if Abu Muttalib's trigger works in, in Times Square in May 2010, are we having but this the discussion? the point is, it didn't. So we have structures in place so you're gonna rely that are on doing luck, quite good. And we're not talking about eliminating all those. We're talking about not empowering and enabling a mythology which really is not tethered to these strikes in local areas. That's been going on but, for a long but time. This isn't a mythology. But the ability to strike here and our ability to neuter that and our ability now to work with the government of Yemen, which, by the way, its new president has come and said we are working and partnering, has openly said we're working with drones, which is kudos. In Somalia, we're working with them. In the transitional authority in Libya now, where we've seen the migration, admittedly, of some Salafi jihadists that were under perhaps uh, uh, the thumb of the Gaddafi regime, and indeed uh, LIFG had pledged a, uh, a truce, if you recall, with Gaddafi. They appear now, according to our own reports from NCTC and others, to have migrated a bit to Mali, and we're working with partners on that. And clearly, if I were Hillary Clinton, I'd be putting out stuff as well, talking about this threat. Notice, she doesn't refer to the threat, Tom, directly as Al-Qaeda. You ascribe that to it. She talks it as about these, the Al-Qaeda Islamic Regret, Regret, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's, 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 that's a name, that's a name which is, one is, one is, one is one that, that's a name which is a consolidated front for the former Algerian Salafi Jihadist movement and the former LIFG, Libyan group, okay, which we knew um, as those elements with regional aspirations long before Al-Qaeda's international organization. So again, as I put in my affirmative speech, if we're going to now accredit Al-Qaeda with the leadership of something that existed in the 1990s, then we are, one, empowering their own rhetoric, two, we're making something larger than it needs to be right now, and three, we're misunderstanding the degree to which we should be working with partners, as we are, and starting to work more with a, a less military hammer and a more strategically applied intelligence, police cooperation, diplomatic arrangement, which will include technological and special forces solutions as we're pursuing right now. Uh, could I, uh, is there a nuance here? I mean. Uh, I mean, you can say that um, uh, Western counter-terrorism uh, has uh, improved enormously 
since 9-11. Uh, and I, I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. Uh, let's take, I know a gentleman in, in, in Great Britain who's an MI5 and he works exhaustively day after day with running th uh, about around a thousand counter surveillance uh, operations, surveillance operations of Islamic militants in the country. Now, he would not say that the, uh, that the Islamic militant threat is defeated. He would say that we just checked it. The DST, which I think is the finest counterterrorist service in the Western world, would say we are checking the counterterrorist threat, but we haven't defeated it. It's still quite vibrant because we're running operations everywhere across the country. We haven't felt the need to pull back those operations because we keep seeing them trying to do something nefarious. So is there, is there a, a difference here between the, eff the effectiveness of Western counterterrorism and then deducing that uh, the opponent is defeated as opposed to he's just for the time, he's, he's, she's checkmated. He may later be defeated. But right now, uh, based on the operations being run, he's, he's far from defeated. Um, you know, I, we're going to kind of get into semantics, but I mean, since you raised London, where I grew up, let me sort of sketch out, I think, what has happened to Al-Qaeda in Britain, which was, if, if any, if every, every, every of the Western countries most threatened by Al-Qaeda was clearly the United Kingdom because of its historic connections to Pakistan. Well, after the 7-7 attack, um, and then the failed 2006 planes plot. I mean, we have seen uh, the British government produce a lot of cases, and these cases take a long time to come to trial in Britain. Um, and this is how, once these cases have gone through the legal system, it has become clear to the British Muslim population that you know the threat from these groups was real. They've turned against them rather dramatically. They booted out Abu Hamza, who's just arrived in this country, who was one of the principal clerics. They've exported Halad al Fawaz who was, uh, in fact, the guy who I went to see to meet bin Laden. Uh, he's just arrived in this country. Um, their kind of approach, I think, up to the 7-7 bombing was um, based on a long-term you know, long British approach to dissent, which, you know, Karl Marx is buried in Highgate Cemetery. And basically, they allowed people to sort of thrive who shouldn't have been allowed to thrive. And it, that's changed. And I think that they have um, the threat from al-Qaeda um, in Britain, I think, has receded very, very dramatically. Um, and we haven't seen anything like, you know, since 2006, that's really the last significant plot that we've seen coming out of the British Isles that threatened the United States and threatened Britain. So I would say Al-Qaeda is essentially defeated in Britain, in addition to being defeated, as far as we're concerned, here in the United States. Now, I, I mean, I, mean I, I spent a, a fair amount of time with uh, European security and domestic intelligence officers. And uh, one does get the impression from them, though, the threat is, in their minds, still, still very much there, whether it be from al-Qaeda or from other Islamic militants. You, you, I do cer certainly also get the impression that the potential for terrorism coming out of the European Muslim community, which not all that long ago, uh, I think uh, many folks would have thought might have been the greatest danger. Uh, these folks had, for a variety of reasons, the character, the, the composite that could have made them quite, quite dangerous. We haven't seen that threat actually develop as much as one might have expected in, in 2000, uh, 2001. Uh, so, I mean, does, does, does Peter have a point there that uh, the, the, the philosophical appeal and allure of uh, of al-Qaeda and other Islamic jihadist groups really hasn't developed as much as it should, should have, certainly in the West. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say a couple things about this. I, I think a lot of what Peter said is right. I agree with a lot of what you said there about the UK and everything. You in Europe. can't say that. Oh, I, I'm, I'm intellectually honest. <laughs> you know, whatever's right is right. You know? We're I mean, just wrong. No, 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 no. no I, mean, you know, I mean, part of it goes to the heart of the whole idea of Muslims living in the West. And part of, I, I'm very, uh, skeptical of the idea of a lot of the rhetoric that's come out uh, from certain quarters in this country about the, the Muslim threat in, in the West because 
when you look at it, you, you don't see this idea that they're adopting Al Qaeda's ideology wholesale. Or that I mean, you just know too many millions of Muslims living in the West who have nothing to do with any of this. And the idea that you're going to sort of lump them into this whole idea, this whole this whole issue, I think, you know, I, I agree with what Peter's saying. You've got to be very careful not to do that. And it's absolutely right. Um, I'll say this though: it, it's not that the ideology is it doesn't have any appeal to those in, in Muslims in the West. I'd say it's 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 a, a minor a very small minority. And what you see is you see them mainly go off to other battlefields. You see them go off to Somalia, for example. Where there's, you've written about a lot of the Western recruits as up high in, in Somalia, you see, including out of Minnesota and in the, in the Midwest. Now, again, when you talk about those recruits, most of the Somali community in Minnesota has nothing to do with this. And actually, those families are victimized by this recruiting practices just as much as anybody else. Um, but you see in the West, you see them going off to uh, you know, northern Pakistan, pre previously were training. And a lot of those drone strikes that we talk about were targeting you know, these German Al Qaeda cells, others who come from the West to come to train. You see them going elsewhere, whether it be uh, you know, in, in North Africa. You, know, you can see European officials talk about the threat of, of, of some going off to North Africa. Overall, however, so there is, there is an issue there. Okay? Overall, however, I think the, the, that is the right point, that basically this is not some giant fifth column that you have to worry about in the Western world of, of you know, people adopting this ideology. Can I, you know, I mean, I think Bruel makes a very good point. I mean, the, this whole question of European Muslims and the lack of terrorist activity is a huge dog that didn't bark. I mean, if you would, you know, Amer American Muslims are better educated than most Americans. Uh, have, they have higher incomes and they don't live in ghettos. Well, reverse every statement and you get this, what, what it's like to, you know, to be a European Muslim. European Muslims have a real reason to be angry, yet this has not really produced very much terrorism at all. And the last, of course, the last attack was the 7-7 attack in, in London. But I'll tell you another dog that didn't bark, and if we'd had this discussion in 2003, the main subject of discussion would be an Al-Qaeda affiliate called Jamaa Islamiyah, which was uh, responsible for the Bali attacks of 2002 that killed most 200 mostly Western tourists. Jamal Islamiyah is basically out of business. After all, this is a, an affiliate with, in the world's largest Muslim country. And it's out of business because these groups always do the same thing. They kill too many fellow Muslims. Um, and it's out of business because of the actions of the Indonesian government, the American government, the Australian government. Um, and it's just defunct. Um, and I, you know, I would, is, am I wrong in this point? It's it's taken, it's taken a heavy toll. I wouldn't say it's totally okay, defunct. Taken but a heavy but, toll. but you're, no, I'm not, I'm not looking to argue with you. I mean, I, you know, that, yeah, I mean, it's just. That J I, JI's infrastructure still exists. They've put the hardcore terrorists, but the madrasas still exist that crank them out, that crank out the radicals. By the way, the people, the important people that are involved of, in on, that group are the, still out there. On the issue of madrasas, just since it's been raised, um, none of the 19 hijackers went to a madrasa for a very good reason. Because people coming out of a madrasa usually are functional idiots who don't speak English. And they don't, you can't get past JFK secure, you know. Or you know, they've been so pith by studying Islamic law for so long that they're just, they're, they're paralyzed. Anyway, the idea that sort of madrasas are a big problem for jihadi terrorism, I think, is, is sort of been overdrawn. And it's in a fact, problem for locally, though. This is a big recruiting base for most of the local. Right, okay. But um, so al in terms of Al Qaeda Central, it's a non issue. I mean, Bin Laden didn't But, you know, that, that's if you agree that Al Qaeda Central isn't interested in conducting attacks on the near enemy, which I contend that it is. It has always been a part of Al Qaeda. I mean, I think what you're talking about is just that it's not that Al Qaeda is defeated, it's just that they've shifted their strategy back a little closer to going after the near Because enemy. they can't do what they really want to do, which well, is attack us. But that doesn't mean in the future they won't be able to. But if you justify the threat as the attacks here in the United States, Bill, I then think it's yeah, important, you're, you're though, to, to go back to the origin. Al Qaeda, the base, the definition, the description, the, the development of it is 96, 97. And it's, it's appending on this notion that we must strike the far enemy first, the decisive blow. Then we can turn and have success against the near enemy. It's because the near enemy thesis was dominant in groups from Algeria to Egypt to Indonesia to the Philippines prior to that time. And so when you look at the uniqueness, the capability and the stricture, as Peter and I have said, that made Al Qaeda what it was and that made it something that was worth the mobilization to the extent that we have seen the mobilization in the Western world, it was in fact that capacity. And I'm sorry, but five failed attempts by fringe elements, none of which really had the same type of cohesive training and bomb making expertise shown that was developed under Al Qaeda's tutelage in the 90s and the early 2000s, that does not make a metastasized global threat. It instead produces something that's a lot more localized, a lot more regional. And no, we don't disestablish structures. We're a lot more scrupulous, I think, in going forward, though, and not imparting to Al Qaeda that which it would have, 
which is its propaganda and claiming responsibility for things as diffuse as Mali or things going on in the Philippines, and instead treat it as the local type of events and the grievances that underwrite and underscore a lot of these local type of events. That's, I think, the point that we're making here, is that's where the focus needs to be. Not somehow ascribing to Al-Qaeda a network structure that indeed existed prior to Al-Qaeda of bin Laden and Zawahiri and is going to exist for a long time into the future. So are you that's saying that totally if you had an affiliated Al-Qaeda group in the United States, and again, the definition of affiliated is the Gebeah, if they were to launch a successful terrorist strike that killed 200 Americans on American soil, not an embassy, but American soil, would that constitute in your mind a resurgence of Al-Qaeda? Or I grant you something that would be traceable back, say, to the western part of Pakistan. I mean, do you, need, actually do, do you need something the more than the Bayah? Yeah, I, I would say so, yes. Because, again, Bayah, in my experience of it living in places in the Gulf and then also in South Asia, okay, the, a, a Bayah swore can be a religious affiliation that can also have a propaganda motivation, can also have a tie and a tether back to mosques in different parts of the world, uh, you know, especially those from South Asia tied back to the richer ones in the Gulf states, that, that in essence is marketing and fundraising, but doesn't say that you're aligned with the philosophy that we must strike against the West as our principal and main focus. It's not the Would you agree with that? Though. I, I don't agree that that's the principal main focus of Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda in the 1990s fought alongside with the Taliban via Brigade 055. That was a primary function of Al Qaeda. And then what it took was cold recruits that came from the craning cramps to conduct attacks against the West. That's indisputable. So I don't, I, I just completely disagree with the notion that Al Qaeda. As, it's, as established, is primarily devoted to... Well, this is good, because I think we to, need to disagree then, because as yeah, I mentioned, have. of the five big things that made Al-Qaeda what it was, three of those are gone. And I don't disagree with Bill that there still is this infusion of local and regional conflicts, whether they be Bosnia or Algeria or other places, with an attempt at ecumen. But it is no longer what it was in terms of the Western if, focus. If and Abu that, for us, Mikhala is the thing that matters the bathroom most. And detonates that bomb instead of tries it in his seat. Which was sophisticated to put design, contrary to what you were saying, by the way, is an underwear bomb. The CIA I, I will mean, tell you. Again, then there's a successful attack. Certainly, we attack. know there's a bomb maker in Yemen who is, More than is one. Pretty, pretty accomplished. Well, I, I think, the, we're, tracking, the, I think we're tracking one primarily right now, but you might be able and, to, and to what, disprove what that. And what Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula right? said is, they laughed at that and said, what do you think, he's yeah, not training people as he's, on the, as, as he's going? Yeah, by the same token, they didn't give him enough training to make sure he'd get it done the first time. And therefore, he's analogous to Richard Reed in 2002 flying in from London who also couldn't set his shoes off. This is far different from the trained hardcore assassins that boarded the planes on 9-11 and knew exactly what they're doing, had been rehearsed. We know we can trace back rehearsals uh, that, that went back to times be planes between Japan and the Philippines in the mid-1990s. That's a far different thing, and, and folks, I would contend to you that that's what tells you more about what the success is going to be of an Al-Qaeda that's a global threat, not the things going on locally or internationally, uh, which we don't need to ignore, far from it. But we do need to understand that it's not the same kind of metastasized, catastrophic threat that for too long has dominated our vocabulary. Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, halt the exchange back and forth here just uh, briefly and uh, throw it out to the audience uh, for questions. Uh, be sure to stick your hand up in the air clearly so I can see it. Be sure that you ask a question and uh, please uh, identify uh, yourself. And, and sort of wait for the mic, which I think is... Um, the mic is coming. It's just coming. Unless you have a really big voice. Mike, uh, here. Yeah. I'm going to give preferential treatment to Cliff. Right? <laughs> Which is your boss. My boss. Your so boss that's your <laughs> boss. <laughs> 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 Foundation <laughs> <laughs> Let me, the question is a very simple one. I'm going to just give two lines of context afterwards. And the question is, Vi What's that? Cliff May, I'm the president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Um, if I heard you correctly, Peter, you said that jihadist terrorism is not over. And my question is, is it on the rise or is it in retreat? Because right, I think that's an important thing to understand here. And I think it's particularly important, and here's the context, because when you say, as you have a, in, in this forum or at the uh, Aspen National Security Forum, that al-Qaeda is dead, it tends to play into the mean that the tide of war is receding and give a certain complacency be, because if al-Qaeda is defeated, 
then perhaps we have very little to worry about. And one of the reasons, and this is an important point, that people have come to that conclusion is you all have here talked about jihadi terrorism and the jihadi ideology, and I commend you for that. Very few American or European leaders will use those terms. They avoid those terms for reasons we could discuss and probably won't have time for. Because they don't discuss that, the belief is that Al-Qaeda is the only threat. If Al-Qaeda is only defeated, we have no more threat. And that also brings me one last thing that I have to not been mentioned and should be, which is the jihadist terrorism we're talking about with Al-Qaeda is Sunni jihadism. But there's also Shia jihadism. Iran is a jihadi state. We are disconnecting the dots between the most important sponsor of terrorism in the world, the one jihadi state, Iran, and then people think also Al-Qaeda is defeated, Iran's a different problem, it's probably just Israel's problem, and we don't have any problems in the world, and we are therefore miscommunicating and misinforming the, the broader public. Thank you, Cliff. I, I, I think I detect a question in there, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I will answer in the following way. Um, you know, I completed my first book about Al-Qaeda 10 days before 9-11, and as I met, that's how I met Ruel in Yemen. Um, and I actually wrote a, a, a very lengthy letter to John Burns of the New York Times, which I forgot about and as a result because of 9-11 and found six months later, basically laying out in a letter uh, over four pages why I thought that an attack on the American interests was sort of imminent in the summer of 2001. John wrote a story in the New York Times, which because of an editing dispute based on kind of the information I was giving him, uh, which didn't make it into the paper on Sunday, September 9th, 2001. Uh, which was basically saying, you know, that there is this Bin Laden is warning about a big attack coming. So I don't think I need to be lectured in any shape or form about um, whether or not I take the threat seriously. Um, and I think my whole life has been, uh, professional life has been devoted to an analyzing th uh, this. And as I sort of talked about in my opening remarks, I just think it's a fact that Al Qaeda is essentially dead. I mean, I have, I'm, I think I'm an objective observer of this and have spent a long time thinking about it. Dead in the terms of its ability to do uh, anything close to 9 11. And, uh, you know, as, as, as Tom has talked about in, at, at some length, I mean, we're not claiming that jihadi terrorism is over, nor are we claiming, by the way, that ordinary crime is over. Uh, you know, I mean, there are certain things that are just a feature of life. Um, the question is one of scale and magnitude. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, um, the idea that Al-Qaeda or an affiliated group can launch an attack that would essentially change our national security, it, that, that, uh, the, the way that we organize our national security, uh, that, that time is over. If I could just add on to that, I, I, I think, Cliff, that your, your, your question and your concern strikes me as a legitimate one, but one I would, would offer this comment to. That is, I think our audience has grown in sophistication over the last decade. And I think even our counterterrorism leadership in this country is figuring that out. Because if you go look at the uh, July 2011 release counterterrorism strategy, you'll see a lot of discussion and reference in there to resilience. And there, and I think that is a, a leading edge, which, which I personally think that people have of both political affiliations are leaning towards, which is that you're never going to drive the terrorist threat to zero. Never. You can, you can expend funds and activities to guard against the worst and the most difficult possible risk. And that's where I think Peter and I agree that we have done a lot of that to now. And we need to be smart in retaining most of it, but we need to also be critical about what we can and cannot retain. And we do understand the difference between a Sunni and a Shia threat and the way in which state sponsorship works there. I also take encouragement from the fact of, of you know, my time spent in the Middle East and, and, and in South Asia. And when you have Al-Qaeda discussed in terms of it's being defeated, it's defeated in the minds of the most important element that's out there long term. And that's in the minds of the youth of the Arab world. Al-Qaeda is seen as either passe or an egregious offense when you discuss it in places like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan or other places uh, about its role in terms of now and the future because of the orgiastic violence it's become associated with and because of the fact it's not seen as a solution. Therefore, local groups often try to dissociate themselves from the Al-Qaeda name and the frame of reference. And here is why I say understanding that should give us an ability to also be nuanced and sophisticated and understanding the threat that still exists, representing it appropriately and dealing with it properly. All right, uh, I'll go. Christina Lamb. Sorry. 
from the Sunday Times, who uh, has done some of the best reporting on this issue. Hi. Um, I thought that was fascinating. Um, I, a couple of things I wanted to ask. The first thing I want to ask you is whether you think that we in the media, but also government officials, actually made Al-Qaeda more of a threat than it actually was by attributing all sorts of things to it that perhaps it wasn't behind, just as in the same way in Afghanistan, things always tend to be blamed on the Taliban when often they're actually tribal attacks and feuds. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you, I mean, I would take issue with what Tom just said about Al-Qaeda being passé in Pakistan. I've spent an awful lot of time there. I've been there several times recently, but I've been going there 25 years. And it seems to me that Al-Qaeda is very much still a recruiting tool among madrasa in Pakistan. Um, of course, combined with the drone attacks. Um, and one attack that you didn't mention when you talked about all the failed attacks in recent years was the Mumbai massacre, uh, where more than 200 people were killed. Now, that was Lashkai Toiba, but there are a lot of links with Al-Qaeda. And of course, they get expertise from Al-Qaeda, even if they're not directly um, organized by them. Yeah. Uh, does your gentleman want to? No, I, I absolutely agree. Pakistan, um, you know, to say that the Pakistanis have denounced Al Qaeda or denounced these terror groups, TTP, their own government and military won't move against the movement of the Taliban in Pakistan in the tribal areas despite horrific attacks, not just against civilians, but against the military and government institutions. Um, it's because that they feel that these groups are popular and they feel that, um, that it's against their interests, the interests of the state. When Cliff, when Cliff says, that you know, Iran's the primary sponsor of state terrorism. The only pl place I might disagree is that you know, Pakistan, to me, is the primary state sponsor of terrorism in that it either shelters these groups or, or does nothing to take them on. So when you have that infrastructure that exists in Pakistan, in Iran, and in, in other countries, it's, it's hard for me to say that Al-Qaeda and its allies have been defeated. Yeah, Christine, if I could jump in there, though. I mean, with, with all due respect, um, I think one, again, has to discriminate in Pakistan uh, about how Pakistanis feel about um, al-Qaeda specific versus the, the general uh, frame of reference, which is uh, a Muslim country under seas, misappreciated and, and done wrong by, by Westerners uh, or Brahmins from India or the others. And I haven't been there um, in Pakistan for a little over a year, but I try to watch carefully you know, what, what the press reports. And indeed, there is this antipathy and this hostility. But it plays out, I would argue to you, much more through local groups, the Abande groups, uh, groups that recruit for uh, HUJI, that recruit for um, uh, Lashkri Janvi, well, even though it's banned officially, Lashkri Taiba, even though it's also banned, OK? And so there's this, this, this general frame of reference. One of my, my research colleagues refers to it as a Petri dish in Pakistan. But when one talks about Mumbai, one also has to talk about where the acumen and the affinity for conducting that strike and attack came from. And we are not clear or certain, uh, but we do know from the Indian court trials that they believe most of it came from uh, low-level uh, operatives uh, associated with uh, Pakistani intelligence services, not from some type of you know, Al-Qaeda direct linked or networked. Okay, so I think, I think that's an important distinction, and therefore, I think I can agree with Bill on some of his point, but also uh, uh, want to uh, frame it a little differently than, than you framed it, and not seeing that there's an affinity for Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. The polling there says that Al-Qaeda is not seen as popular, okay? But these other anti-Western um, uh, types of uh, Muslim groups uh, are seen as very popular. You want to just a quick thing on, on the, the Mumbai strikes. Um, you know, it's not exactly clear how much involvement of senior level Al Qaeda guys are involved there. I mean, one of the things that Bruce Rydell, a former Obama administration advisor, President Obama's advisor, has told the Indian press is that based on his uh, briefings on bin Laden's documents captured in Abbottabad, there's evidence that, in fact, bin Laden was not only in touch with senior Lashkari Taiba leaders right up until his demise, but also may have seen surveillance reports used in the Lashkari Taiba uh, attack on Mumbai. Um, that's according to Bruce Rydell. It doesn't come from me. It's from Bruce Rydell, former Obama administration advisor. I would say uh, those documents and basically much of what's in the cache, and this is what I'd ask the press to, to fight for, is those documents should be see the light of day. If that, if that is, is what Bruce Rydell says, then that tells a very different story about what's going on in multiple levels. Never let the government hide documents. Uh, right there in the blue shirt, blue tie. Sean Woodman. Sean Woodman. Uh, hi, my name is Yago Kozlowski. I'm from the Washington Quarterly. 
uh, allow me to apologize myself. I'm not an uh, American citizen, so English is not my native language. I'll try to make myself uh, clear. Uh, my question is um, directed towards the side defending the fact that Al-Qaeda is defeated. Uh, you said that the main purpose of Al-Qaeda and the main strategy was first making a foreign decisive blow and afterwards uh, or, uh, orientating the focus more towards closer attacks in the region. Um, the other side said that the main goal was focusing on the closer attacks in the region no matter what. Um, even if I go along in the thought that uh, the side defending that Al-Qaeda is defeated said um, first make a decisive blow f abroad and then closer attacks in the region, if I, even if I go along in that, um, what if the time frame is different and we are cu currently in the second phase and we are currently witnessing closer attacks in the region and we are currently witnessing Al-Qaeda uh, getting a stronger local base in order to have a even more decisive uh, foreign blow than 9-11 was? What if the time frame is different? Um, do you think that's possible that Al-Qaeda is just trying to strengthen itself more in order to have an even bigger attack, I'm not saying within the next five years, maybe even 50 years, even a more decisive blow than 9-11 was. You know, there's a sort of logical fallacy that was fairly common in the years after 9-11, which is the reason they haven't attacked us is they, they, they want to do something so big that it's even bigger than 9-11. And this is actually one of these, it's a, it's a, it's a non to use a kind of technical term, it's a non-falsifiable proposition because the evidence for the proposition is the fact we haven't been attacked is merely evidence that they're planning something even bigger. This doesn't make any sense. The, you know, as Yogi Berra famously said, it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. But I think when you look at the actual evidence, the, you know, they continue to try and attack us, even low-level attacks, and they just haven't succeeded, which suggests that they are you know, not able to do anything of any real significance. It's not like they are waiting to do something bigger than 9-11. After all, they trained uh, you know, uh, Najib ul Azazi. Uh, to go and attack, and if he succeeded, he would have killed a few dozen people in Manhattan. So they're prepared, they, they're trying to get anything through, and they even, even with these small bore attacks, they're not succeeding. Najibul Azazi, as you recall, drove from Denver to Manhattan in 2009 around the September 11th anniversary, and he failed. Yeah, quick one. <clears throat> You know, on that point, I think we, we're looking at this often from our perspective, but what about from Al-Qaeda's perspective? And I can only guess, I'll, I'll try and red team this here. By the way, we have a very good answer to that question with the documents released in Abdabad, and you, you, know, you know as well as I do, Bill, because you've read them. It's an account. Only Bill, 17 documents. Okay, Bin Laden's own account. That were hand-selected okay. to support a view. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bin Laden's account of what was going on in Al-Qaeda was pretty grim based on... According to 17 selected documents, one that was 17. seriously redacted. Um, look at this from Al-Qaeda. Thousands upon thousands have been translated. None of the, again, the press that's here should be calling for all these to be released to the public so we can do our own analysis. But go ahead. Um, from Al-Qaeda's perspective, we've left Iraq. And look at how that's gone. We're leaving Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda really it worked really well for them in Iraq, right? Yeah. Well, look at them today. The attacks have doubled. Their network's extended. They're extending attacks into Syria by supporting the al-Nusra front. They suffered, they, stu they suffered, Bill, as you well know, and you were there, a strate sure. strategic sure. defeat They in absolutely were defeated in 2008, but this is 2012, where we've disengaged, where Sunni tribal leaders have said, where is America? We haven't, after we withdrew, we left. We left an important group of people that could have provided us intelligence, not just in Iraq, but throughout the Middle East. You know the way the tribes spread across borders. We've abandoned this. The Iraqis, Al-Qaeda in Iraq sees this. Al-Qaeda sees this. Again, I'm red teaming it from their perspective. Way, They're looking okay. at us disengaging Bill, from the Middle East. When was the last time Al-Qaeda in Iraq did an out-of-country operation? Al-Qaeda Al in Iraq did an out-of-country operation? Yeah. Well, Yesterday in Syria. Yeah, all the time in Syria. But, yeah, but, not only, mean, but not only that, but not only that, but Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who leads al-Qaeda in Iraq, has threatened us in the summer of this year. He openly threatened us. Now, you know, is he actually going to, is he concentrating on attacking us right now? No, he's, got, he's pl planning all sorts of other operations. In fact, al-Qaeda in Iraq's attack tempo has gone from, according to the Pentagon, and according to reporting in the CNN, uh, by CNN and elsewhere, has gone from 75 attacks per week earlier this year to over 140 a week now. 
That's the jump that's happened just this year in Al Qaeda in Iraq. So yes, they were discredited. They had suffered uh, monumental blows in Iraq. But guess what? Things are not static. Okay, these aren't these aren't still pictures. This is a continuum, and you have to follow these threats as they move through time. And as what we see right now, according to the Obama administration itself, says that it cannot arm the Syrian rebels because it's too worried about Al Qaeda in Iraq's presence amongst the Syrian rebels. That's not me saying it. That's top. This is a Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's top Obama administration officials. They're saying this is a threat. That also might be an excuse. P Peter, I want one more. Uh, quick I'm not, let me ta let me take another uh, question here. Uh, Sean Waterman. Sean Waterman. Thank you. Forward. Uh, <coughs> yes, Sean Waterman from the Washington Times. I'd like to um, ask both uh, sides of the debate to enlarge on on a point that was touched on briefly, which is the impact of the. Uh, revolts in uh, in the Arab world again, the uh, the toppling of the secular dictatorships. Um, obviously, you know the intelligence services in Egypt were huge allies of the United States. Um, there were mo most uh, renditions were to Egypt, um, Jordan. Uh, obviously, they're still there. But what? My question is, what impact has the uh, Arab Spring had? In terms of this, you know, this debate, this 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 uh, variable that we're looking at, and um, I'd also be interested to know uh, if anyone has any comments on Tom Jocelyn's uh, research, which suggested that uh, Al Qaeda leaders in the Arab world were involved uh, in in these protests, uh, these anti-American protests uh, uh, sparked by the by the video. You know, the, our opponents haven't said this directly, but you could take away an implication from some of the things they're saying, which is that basically it was better under Gaddafi and better under Mubarak. There was, it was more stable and less chaotic, and the weak, these intelligence services were giving us information about the jihadis. No, and I, no totally absolutely okay. not. Okay, good, because then we're all in agreement about the following proposition, which is that you know, the reason that Al-Qaeda and groups like it basically came to exist is because of these authoritarian regimes. It's not an accident that so many people in Al-Qaeda were from Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Egypt or Libya. And the fact that these regimes have fallen is, a, is, is going to really take the, the, the wind out of these groups over time because uh, there will be more political space for Islamist ideas that aren't necessarily tied to, to violence. Um, and, you know, it's not an accident that Saeed Qutub and, and Ayman al-Zawari, you know, became more radicalized than Abu Musab al-Zakawi in a Jordanian prison. And as these regimes, as these authoritarian regimes fall, Al-Qaeda and groups like it are just going to have less and less appeal over time. And I think the winds of history, whether or not you agree with Tom and myself on this issue, history itself, I think, is in agreement in the sense that the tide is turning against these groups because the kind of conditions that created them are going. Just if I could, you know, when I worked with U.S. CENTCOM and then when I lived in Qatar, we had these discussions all the time about what was the alternative to Al-Qaeda in some of these very repressive countries that Peter has talked about. Well, you know, our answer was we wanted to try to encourage more political participation, more voice that didn't rely upon violence or the, the tumultuous turnover or overthrow of these regimes. Well, to a certain extent, we've, we've got what we want, we've wanted over two administrations from two different parties. That doesn't mean in the short term, though, we're not going to see turbulence. That doesn't mean in the short term, when you, when you disrupt an old order, there's not space for those wedded to violence to maneuver in. But I, like Peter, believe that we are now in the, the period of turbulence that's, that's on the way to the alternatives that the youth and the youth bulge of these Muslim countries really do need, which is to see that political participation can give them voice, can turn them into something besides jihadi violence, and can produce results over the long term. And just a really quick thing to add. In Benghazi, immediately after the attack on the consulate, there were yeah. thousands of people took to the streets, and they attacked the Ansar al-Sharia organization, which is believed to be behind the attack, and burned, the, burned their facility to the ground. That kind of activity just could not have happened uh, while the authoritarian regimes were in, were in power. So I think that you know, there was actually an anti-jihadi movement, which is now beginning to sort of come to fruition in some of these countries, which simply there was no political space for that previously. And that's where I say that al-Qaeda, the brand, is in worse shape now, even though you may see it spasming to take advantage of the short term. It's because in the long term, it has now had a, had a competitor develop in each of these different locations that it will not contend with well into the future. I don't think we have any disagreement on this side, do we? No, I just want to say one, okay, quick, one quick thing. I mean, I, 
Yeah, in terms of the Arab Spring and, and long-term hopes, I, you know, I, Ruel's written about this, you've written about this. I, you know, I think we agree, you know, basically in the long run, you, know, this, you can see that the Arab Spring has a lot of hope for the defeat of these organizations, a absolutely. The problem is that in the short term, they can exploit, and according to official government documents they have, the security vacuums that are left behind. And you know, human history is not deterministic. You know, it, it moves on a razor's edge one way or the other. And so it's, it's, that's why I think, and that's why I made the large point about supporting Muslims throughout the, the Arab world, and the Muslim world, and all these Arab Spring countries, because there are tons of allies crying for America to stand with them against these groups. Okay, that's why, that, that's why I said that. That's why it's important, because if you want to help history along, and you want to actually really defeat Al-Qaeda, then we can't say, okay, well, it's all over. We can pack our bags and go home today. We have to come up with a real strategy for engaging all these different groups that are basically opposing Al-Qaeda. And I'll say this about Ambassador Stevens, who's really a real hero in all this. I've, I've been studying all the leaked cables that came out from his uh, consulate there and everything else. Uh, the guy is, I mean, to me, he's a hero. He really is. Here's a guy, though, I want, I want to say something about it. Here's a guy who, who understood that Al Qaeda was a threat in Libya. Okay, there are leaked cables that he classified that says that he sh that show that Al Qaeda is a threat in Libya, and it's growing before Gaddafi fell, which is why we're not better off with Gaddafi. And these, these leaked cables show that. Um, but yet he made a choice. He made a personal choice to stand with all those opposed to Al Qaeda and Al Qaedaism in the, in the rebellion and opposed to Gaddafi because he saw the potential inside Libya. I think that's a real sign of hope in Libya and elsewhere. So we we agree on that. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, then we'll go to the closing statements. Uh, right there, the gentleman in the back. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Morgan. I edit the blog Confused Eagle. I have a question. I want to change one of the questions that was just previously asked about the author authoritarian state. What if Al Qaeda is just scaling back operations in search of a failing state that they can actually exploit the lack of secu a strong security apparatus to set up another basis of operation? like perhaps what we're seeing in northern Mali, what they've tried to do in the past and failed in Somalia. Could they be setting up operations like that and trying to plan in the future? And another thing, situation we haven't really heard about is the support that Al-Qaeda has had in the past for the Chechens in Russia. How would that also focus in the, uh, into this debate as well? Thank you. Gentlemen? Well, I'll, I'll take the part about the, the Chechnya, I mean, how many times have the Russians de declared that um, organization defeated? It, it's shown its resili resiliency. It still exists. It's greatly weakened, but over time has shown the ability to regenerate and conduct terrorist attacks in Moscow. Tolstoy Numerous was fighting the Russians. In, uh, uh, Tolstoy uh, was understood. fighting the Chechens in 1850. Under I mean, this is a kind of a nationalist right. movement, basically. Oh, which yeah. is, well. A little, little different than that, Peter. I mean, when you look at the Islamic Caucus Emirate, um, conducting suicide bombings inside in subways in Moscow. I don't think Tolstoy. It's not Al Qaeda that. coming back. It's not Al Qaeda. It, it, okay. Well, we'll have to agree okay. to disagree yeah. on that. Make another debate. Yeah, that's a whole other debate there. You know, th I, I think it's I mean, the perfect I mean, example of the of the resiliency of these groups. It really was majorly set back from about two thousand five. Can, can I to to just take moderator's privilege here? You're, you're not disagreeing with the, the contention though that. It is quite possible that you can have a nationalist Islamist group go terrorists and uh, use tactics that Al Qaeda uses and have nothing to do with Al Qaeda, right? Well, it is possible. However, there have been members of that group that You're are about members of Al Qaeda. Biography, specific individuals yeah. so you can point to. That's where okay. the okay. distinction becomes. It's not a generic argument. Okay. It's about yeah. specific, right. about specific, specific individuals. Now, look, a defeat of an organization. You know, Peter says this. You know. We didn't have to kill every Nazi to, to win the World War II. However, the German government and the Japanese government did, did its cease attacks on us. That's what victory and what defeat looks like. We're not looking at an organization here that has said, well, we're defeated and we're going to stop conducting operations. They're still doing it. They may be hurt. They may have suffered strategic setbacks, but they're adapting their operations to continue to achieve their goals. All right, uh, to the gentleman in the back right there. Uh, how is he from uh, Pakistan? Well, adding in this Chechen and Central Asian Al Qaeda side, uh, from Pakistani perspective, when I see these Chechens, the Uzbeks, uh, Xinjiang, Turkmans, uh, and uh, uh, people from uh, elsewhere, uh, I look at Al Qaeda very differently. And uh, maybe you, it, it does not look like uh, the way it is in Pakistan, but uh, all this element is together in North Pakistan, uh, uh, contributing their resources, contributing their training skill, uh, 
could I have to just, I don't, I don't mean to rush you here, but uh, could you just give us the question, please? Uh, this is a question, actually, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm actually questioning that Chechen or uh, Xinjiang or Uzbek flavor are not local. Now they have become Al-Qaeda because a lot of their training is being held in North Waziristan. Second thing is about Al-Qaeda uh, network and movement. How about if it has been turned in ideology, what we call takfiri. I didn't heard about this, uh, in fact, uh, phrase which has been very common in the rest of the world, or s at least in my part of the world. Uh, it is not Salafist anymore. Uh, th there is a big difference between Salafist and takfiris. Uh, anyone who can, uh, you know, elaborate on it? Well, I'd, I'd willingly jump in on that. I, I, I think you're exactly right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the takfiri strain of the, shal of the Salafi that become very violent and very oriented against their fellow Muslims for not being pure and specific enough. And therefore, it's not a surprise that the vast majority of those who have suffered and been killed have, in fact, been fellow Muslims in the, in the campaigns that have been conducted uh, by these jihadi organizations over time. So I, I can't possibly disagree with, with you on that. I, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's not a word that has much cachet you know, in, in the English language, but certainly is one that resonates in South Asia and, and does uh, in, in the Gulf Muslim states. Let, let me add, though, about the, the comment and the question about the different locations, different venues. I mean, Bill and, and, uh, and certainly, uh, I think, Tom and support, you know, have, have talked about the Al-Qaeda affiliates found in Afghanistan and other places. I think we need to be very careful here, again, to talk specifically about who we are dealing with. When we're talking about uh, the Islamic Jihadi Union, or the IMU, who have purpose, objectives, and stated goals to overthrow the regime in Uzbekistan, and who have, after having been driven out of their valleys of preferred training in the 1990s, worked and coalesced in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Uh, you, have, you have groups and elements that clearly are of the ideology and believe in the violence and the overthrow of the regimes they see as corrupt and insufficiently Muslim. But you don't necessarily have them doing uh, the bidding uh, internationally of Al-Qaeda. Now, we know IMU and IJU have, in fact, planned and attempted attacks uh, in, in Germany. We also know that Pakistan and Pakistan's military and intelligence services have helped us uh, in, the, in recent years uh, corral uh, and, and arrest and detain or kill those who've been involved in those types of activities in places like Quetta or the, or, or the Fata area. So I, mean, I think you've got an example here where, where these groups are not of their own nature and face wedded to the great international strike Okay, and when they are, that there's dampeners or constrainers uh, working with counter-terrorist operations and affiliates in Pakistan as well as with the West that, that bring to bear uh, and, and, and arrest the, these, these potential plots. All right, we're going to go to closing uh, statements now. Uh, we've got two minutes uh, for each individual, and then you folks uh, can vote. So I will go to uh, Tom Jocelyn, who just broke his chair. <laughs> That's about right. Um, so the motion here... Put aside everything you just heard for, for a minute, okay? The motion here is very simple. Is Al-Qaeda defeated, okay? The official position of the U.S. government is no, okay? The official position of the State Department, the National Counterterrorism Center, numerous officials who talk about the threat, which they can downplay all they want, is that it's not defeated, okay? At most, what they can tell you is now that supposedly this has all been localized. These localized threats are now trumping the transnational threats, and so therefore we don't really have to worry about it as much anymore, and therefore it's defeated. Well, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary on that. As my colleague Bill Rogier was talking about, uh, you know, in pre-9-11 Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda did fight alongside the Taliban, had, had fighting units that were recruited. That was one of their main recruiting mechanisms throughout the, the Muslim and Arab world from Yemen, Saudi Arabia, elsewhere, was to bring fighters in to fight alongside the, the Taliban against the Northern Alliance. They've had this strategy for being part of the local jihad, the regional, the regional interest that they're trying to disconnect the dots on for a long time, okay? A long time. This is not new. And you talk about whether or not these groups pose a threat to... Uh, the West. I heard uh, Peter say that these groups like in Mali don't necessarily pose a threat to the rest. Well, I, I'd like to say that according to CNN on October 3rd, a European official was quoted as saying that Al-Qaeda is spreading and poses a direct threat to us. The European official said, we know the hard way that if Al-Qaeda fighters have a free zone, they'll try to attack us all over the place, the official said. We consider AQIM the growing and maybe the leading threat against us. This is a European official. Um, so there are a lot of officials in the U.S. government and European governments that disagree with these gentlemen have said. Okay? Disagrees with what the official U.S. government says. Disagrees with a lot of history, a lot of facts. Okay? And the bottom line at the end of the day is prior to 9-11, Al-Qaeda had only killed, according to the 9-11 Commission report, 50 or less people. Okay? If you're going to go by the number of Americans killed prior to 9-11, you'd say, well, you know, they've only killed 50 or less people. This is why some people slept on the threat. 
in the meantime, the threat was growing. It was a, a threat that at that point in time, we did not understand because we weren't doing the, the connect the dots analysis we needed to do. We weren't actually piecing together the picture. We weren't actually going through and figuring out what, how the threat was metastasizing. Again, according to the National Counterterrorism Center, according to the State Department, that threat has metastasized and it is a threat. And so what these guys are arguing is complete opposite of what the U.S. government today says. Colonel. Uh, sorry. Yeah. All right, thank you. And, and, and thanks to, to our noble opponents today, who I think have, have made the best of the case that can be made, but still an insufficient case. And I'd like to argue to you why that is. That is. Um, specifically, uh, quoting U.S. government officials um, is, is useful, but I don't think uh, deterministic in how one should think about al-Qaeda. Um, we all know that governmental organizations uh, do their best and their level best, uh, but are risk averse. And so much as Peter was the, the, a bellwether of al-Qaeda's risk uh, 12 years ago, uh, I think it's important for us to also serve as a bellwether of um, uh, putting too many lines and arrows between too many dots that are no longer as connected as they once were. And as a consequence, I stand before you resolved that in the strategic sense, al-Qaeda of bin Laden has been defeated since at least the summer of 2011. Al-Qaeda itself has had much to do with this outcome by pursuing the self-defeating tactics of violence upon more violence across the Muslim world. And that tactic will continue to self-defeat if we don't find a way to oxygenate it beyond the point that it deserves. Orgiastic violence assured the accelerating political isolation of Al-Qaeda in the Muslim world during the mid-2000s, which was then accompanied by a successful post-2007 effort by the United States and allied governments that largely has destroyed Al-Qaeda Central's leadership along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border and put asunder its aspirations for now and for any foreseeable time in the future to drive the West out of the Islamic world based upon these catastrophic strikes internationally. The May death in 2011 of bin Laden has drawn an end to the stabilizing pattern of hunt and escape that elevated the terrorist leader's reputation and to a lesser extent that of Zawahiri into a living legend and as a result the reputation of Al-Qaeda has suffered proportionally. Indeed bin Laden's demise has provided the substantial solution to the most critical international security challenges posed by his construct of Al-Qaeda and that which we keep referring to unwittingly in a manner that gives more life to this organization than it deserves right now. What's now important is to allow Al-Qaeda's obvious defeat and its growing isolation to help form into the alternative. Those nonviolent Muslim approaches toward political change in the Islamic world, okay, and let those better in frame, uh, inform the U.S. framework for counterterrorism policy. And I've mentioned that our counterterrorism policy is now referring to this notion of resilience and we can't guard against all terrorist strikes, but we can work with allies and partners to mitigate those that occur overseas and continue to protect ourselves. That's what I think Peter and I are advocating going forward. And as a consequence, the most effective U.S. counterterrorism approach globally now can be to continue to call attention to Al-Qaeda's inherent contradictions and weaknesses, to not conflate individual, regional, and local Salafi jihadist uh, grievances and insurgencies into this larger core and as much as possible take no action that might ease Al-Qaeda's ability to reclaim its former political, financial, and recruiting support. Because these in fact have all dissipated and its threat, its catastrophic terrorist threat, is in fact defeated. Thank you. Bill Rojo. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Peter and Tom. Uh, definitely was a spirited debate and I think they, they, they've made a good argument but uh, I still think it falls short. You know, look, it's not just U.S. officials saying that Al-Qaeda is a resilient organization and it's a threat. I don't know how many of you saw Laura Logan's segment on, uh, on 60 Minutes the other, other day, or Bob, what Bob Woodward wrote the other day as well. Um, this isn't just U.S. officials. This is people that are, are watching this threat. It's not just Tom and I. I think when we, we're, we're narrowly defining what defeat means, setbacks, strategic setbacks, even if, if you want to say that they've happened, and I'd agree in some areas Al-Qaeda has, has suffered some setbacks, especially to leadership. Um, but in other areas, it's, it's cooperated closely with its affiliates. So the setback is not a defeat. Al-Qaeda has not ceased its goal to drive the U.S. out of the Middle East and to conduct terrorist attacks. Just because they haven't conducted a terrorist attack on U.S. soil, they haven't successfully conducted a terrorist attack on U.S. soil, doesn't mean the group is, defe is defeated. Um, Al-Qaeda is still fighting locally. As, uh, against the U.S. It's conducting attacks in against U.S. and Afghanistan. There's been raids on U.S. bases where Al-Qaeda fighters are cooperated with the Taliban, Islamic movement in Uzbekistan. Um, Al-Qaeda has, has evolved to meet the challenges that it's faced uh, during its last year of war against the United States. It, you know, if it, can't, if it can't hit us directly, and who's to say they're still not trying? We don't really know that. All we know is that attacks have failed. But they're still attempting to organize 
at, at the local levels. And, the, and the, you know, to me, the fact that all of the al-Qaeda affiliates, as well as these newly pop propping up Salafist groups, are pledging allegiance to al-Qaeda, tells you that Zawahiri is not, is not an unpopular leader, and the group has no cachet, at least within the jihadist movement. Look, how many times did the Bush administration from 2003 to 2008 declare al-Qaeda dead? I, by my count, it was around three or four times. You know, he would hold up cards, hold up you know, a scorecard showing dead leaders. Counting dead leaders is not a way to judge how al-Qaeda has been defeated, nor is polling data in the Middle East. You have to look at the organization, its ability to conduct attacks, both locally and globally, and its resiliency. And I think that when you, when you objectively look at all of this, you see that it's an organization that may have suffered some, some local setbacks or some, some setbacks to its, its leadership, but it's still in the game, it's still in the fight, and it, it, has, it, it intends to be in the fight for decades to come. Thank you very much. And closing for the affirmative, Peter. Um, I'm glad that Bill mentioned al-Qaeda's dead leaders because the best, um, I think, case for al-Qaeda's defeat is provided by its founder and leader, Osama bin Laden, who in the documents recovered in the, in the Abdabad compound made a number of, I think, very significant points. First of all, he wrote to the al-Shabaab affiliate in Somalia saying, do not use the word al-Qaeda in your name because you'll find it hard to fundraise and you'll attract a great deal of negative attention. He was quite conscious uh, how the Al-Qaeda brand had been diminished. In fact, he noodled with changing the name of the group to some distinctly uncatchy alternatives like the Monotheism and Jihad group um, and other uh, such uh, new names. So bin Laden himself understood that the Al-Qaeda brand was in deep trouble. He told his, he told his deputies, don't communicate uh, on the internet, only communicate by mail. That meant that when he was communicating with his deputies, it would t sometimes take two or three months uh, for a response to come to one of his queries, if it came at all. Not a very efficient way to, to run an organization. The group was deeply aware of how uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had really damaged the brand. They, uh, a lot of the documents talk about how Al-Qaeda in Iraq had dealt as a grievous uh, uh, blow to the brand. On the question of drones, which Bill mentioned earlier, and he's one of the world's leading experts on this, on this subject, you know, bin Laden wrote a memo saying, I'm leaning to get, to get my brothers out of the Pakistani tribal regions and, and send them to Afghanistan. He was so conscious of the fact that the drones were decimating his organization. He was advising his 20-year-old son Hamza, if he was in Waziristan, to move to Qatar, which is sort of the Switzerland of the Middle East, and one of the, is probably the richest country in the world per capita. Um, so he was still inciting people to holy war, but telling his own son to move to one of the safest countries in the world. Um, they set up a counterintelligence shop uh, inside Al-Qaeda to try and find the spies who were giving the information that were leading to these successful drone attacks. But they only had a few thousand dollars to fund it, and basically this counterintelligence sh shop failed. And in, in these documents, there's a discussion, we're running out of money, we need to start kidnapping di uh, diplomats in Pakistan, basically to get ransoms to, uh, to, to refill our coffers. So if this is the supposedly serious threat that we face, um, I think it's, it's sort of ahistorical to, to term it as such. I mean, the United States almost was destroyed during the Civil War in the in mid-19th century. If the Nazis had won in Europe, Western civilization would have been over. If the Cold War had ended with a bang instead of a whimper, we'd all be dead. No one would be in this room. These were real threats. Um, but the threat that al-Qaeda poses is infinitesimally small compared to these threats. And just to remind you, 17 Americans have died at the, at the hands of jihadi terrorism since 9-11. Uh, since this is a very small number. And if this is a major threat, as our opponents suggest, um, I just think that's, we, 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 Tom and myself, do not find that to be an accurate view of the world. All right, I, I suggest, I please email. all of you vote, vote honestly. Uh, and uh, on behalf of FDD and NAF, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and please give a round of applause to the four gentlemen. <laughs>